The 2020 Minority Health Film Festival offers a diverse variety of films and events that we just wouldn't be able to offer in the in-person cinema experience. But I think what really makes it unique is the focus, not only on public health issues, but the issues that really concern communities of color. If you're looking for a reason to engage or to try it out, this is the perfect time. Just go to mkefilm.org slash mhff. Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us this morning. Or if you're watching it on Playbook, thank you whatever time of day you're watching this. Um, welcome to day eight of the Minority Health Film Festival, sponsored by Freighter and the Medical Colleges of Wisconsin. We'd also like to recognize the Queer Curatorial Fund of the University of Wisconsin-Madison Department of Film, Video, Animation, and New Genres for being a sponsor for this uh, film and the panel. Um, this panel that you're about to see is related to the film Making Sweet Tea, which is part of the Minority Health Film Festival. If you haven't seen it already, I strongly encourage you to check it out maybe immediately after this panel. My name is Aster Gilbert, and I am the Genre Queer Program Coordinator for Milwaukee Film, and one of the programmers of the Minority Health Film Festival. Um, you can ask questions for the panelists. Um, type that in the comments section on YouTube or Facebook. Uh, be sure to do that. And now, joining me today are three very special guests, uh, the subject and filmmakers of the film Making Sweet Tea. And we're gonna bring those on now. Hi, everyone. Um, Hi. Hey, Esther. Hello. Um, would you like to, each of you, introduce yourself, um, who you are, and what your relationship or role is with the film Making Sweet Tea? Sure. I'm E. Patrick Johnson, and I'm one of the subjects of the film and co-executive producer. And I'm John Jackson, Jr. I'm also executive producer and co-director. I'm Nora Gross, I'm the other co-director uh, and a producer and cinematographer on the film. Thank you, everyone. Um, so to get started, I had a couple questions about this film and how it came together. Um, now, for those that don't know, um, that haven't seen Making Sweet Tea yet, this is kind of a, an evolution or extension of um, Dr. E. Patrick Johnson's work, um, oral histories and performance pieces. So I'm very interested to hear um, how did each of you get involved in this project and how did this project come to be? And anyone that wants to jump in first can, or I can call on you if we need to do. <laughs> well, I, I think E. Patrick could start because the, <laughs> the, the, the project begins long before the film was even an idea. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I was gonna say the, the film wasn't my idea. I was uh, dragged along into that. <laughs> uh, no, uh, so it started out as a, a, a book. Um, but even before the book uh, came about, um, I was conducting these oral histories and doing some ethnographic research in the South uh, on black gay men. And uh, that started in 2004, actually. So between 2004 and 2006 was when I was co collecting the stories. And then in 2006, I started performing uh, some of the stories that I had collected, again, two years before the book came out. And then um, after touring with a stage reading version of the show, uh, a producer, Jane M. Sachs, approached me about uh, taking it to the stage uh, in a full length um, production, still a, a solo piece, but uh, a uh, fully produced uh, play. And the play debuted, it's hard to believe that it's now been uh, 11 years ago uh, in Chicago. And uh, John was at the premiere of that uh, show and had the idea, because he's a filmmaker, uh, to um, document the process of translating it from a book to a stage, a reading to a play. And, um, we really didn't do anything with the idea for a couple of years uh, until we got serious and uh, started shooting, uh, still not knowing what it was ultimately going to be about. Um, but 
and I'll let I'll let uh, John and Nora fill in some of the the backstory. Well, but. I, I, I was gonna I was gonna say that the other version of historical context for this is that Nora and I, well, all three of us are academics, but Nora and I were at the University of Pennsylvania, part of a student and faculty coalition or collective organized around trying to redefine what scholarship looks like, what counts as intellectual activity. And we were doing that under the rubric of what we were calling multimodal scholarship. So that included film, audio, dance, like what are the different ways we can take the knowledge that we want to acquire and find methods for doing that that are unconventional? And then how do we turn the dial one more rotation and think about presenting that material in something other than an article or book form? And so we've been working on that for a long time. And in a sense, Nora and I came at this saying, well, E. Patrick Johnson's method, his practice, is an instantiation of that very phenomenon, right? Taking something from social science interview all the way to the stage, and that the stage is a version of its final form. So we thought, well, what would it mean to try to capture his process, capture his relationship to those um, black men in the film, and then use that process of putting his practice onto film to talk about our own, and, and Nora can sort of speak to this from her own perspective, our own investment in recalibrating what academia understands as scholarship in the 21st century. To say, we're making a documentary film for a large audience, but also as a different example of what scholarship can look like. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> and that um, that was, so I, I came on board sort of in the, well, actually for the audience, maybe you don't have a sense of how long of a time period we're talking about. So Patrick mentioned that the the production of the play began 11 years ago um, and the film has probably been sort of in earnest in production for the last seven or eight or maybe even nine years. Um, and uh, so I came on board in the in about six years ago. Um, and as John mentioned, I was part of this collective of, um, of folks, academics at University of Pennsylvania. I was a first year doctoral student. John was my first professor in my very first doctoral course. Um, and I arrived at, at Penn as a filmmaker, wanting to think about the way that film could be, um, uh, could, could add to research, could be an, another way to, um, to share research more broadly. Um, and so when, when this, um, project started really taking shape. It, um, it in some ways became the highlight of this this collaborative um, group of people. You know, we, this became the kind of star of of uh, the kind of work that we were thinking about doing, and how to do it. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I want to kind of um, build off of those responses because. Um, I'm also kind of an academic. I'm finishing my dissertation, but I don't want to. So the temptation to kind of nerd out on these academic concepts is really strong right now. But I, I'm really interested in this um, this topic that you brought up, John, about translating or transforming or challenging what scholarship is, right? Because obviously, I believe in the power of scholarship, but it is often trapped behind a paywall, um, even though academics not necessarily want that. It's just kind of how the institutions function or the role of jargon in academia, which is useful for being concise, but can also be kind of alienating. Um, mm -hmm. And I'm seeing a lot of parallels and themes with some of the mission statements behind the Minority Health Film Festival, which is using the power of film, um, especially uh, virtually during this pandemic to reach a broader audience, to talk about really um, important and uh, urgent topics of all sorts. And so I would love to hear a little bit more from, from everyone if possible on um, what you see the either the responsibility or the importance of translating and challenging what is understood as scholarship for a broader audience. Because as a queer trans person in women and gender studies, this is a big question for us um, where the subjects that we are studying and who we are as people are often historically left out of these systems and that can often lead to dismissing or marginalizing different forms of knowledge, which is kind of oral histories thing as well. So I would love to, I'll stop there so I don't keep rambling, but I would love to hear some more um, thoughts or comments on that if possible. Um, I, I'll start by saying one of the motivations for me doing um, the book in the first place was um, translating um, 
quotidian theory up. So um, we have, uh, you know, to take an example of, of, of you, Aster, in a, a discipline called Women and Gender Studies, and we know that one of the most famous theorists in that area is Judith Butler. Um, but you take someone like Judith Butler, who's uh, a philosopher, and the the kind of uh, language and discourse that um, she uses in her work, you know, is dense. Um, and there is a um, a person in Making Sweet Tea uh, by the name of Charles, who for me, um, in one um, or two sentences of their uh, narrative explains Judith Butler from a quotidian uh, theoretical perspective. Um, so uh, Charles says um, in, in part of his uh, narrative, uh, why should I risk losing my life on a surgeon's table to appease others? And why, uh, because does uh, having a vagina or long hair uh, really constitute being a woman, or does a penis and a, uh, a muscular physique truly constitute being a man? The only one that can decide that is yourself. So again, in three sentences, we have gender trouble. And so for me, uh, giving a platform to uh, everyday folk to theorize, because we're all theorists, uh, to understand how um, theory and discourse and knowledge production is not a one-way flow down from academics to, you know, everyday folk, but it's also a way to um, give a platform for folks to um, uh, disseminate quotidian theory. Um, so none of my work uh, as, has an impetus for only speaking to academics. Um, and the last thing I'll say is I always try to create uh, academic knowledge that um, is recognizable to the very subjects whose lives are contained therein. Um, so that was one of the motivations for me for uh, doing the book in the first place. I think I would just add, I think Nora always wants to go after. But um, you could also jump in first. Um, so I, 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 for, for me, one of the motivations is also predicated on um, my assumption. I think we have a, a lot of data at this point to back it up, that the question of multimodal scholarship is also about who feels invited to be in the academy. It's about like who, so, so part of what we find at least at Penn is that the vast majority of the PhD students who have participated in this multimodal work are students who either would not have been in the academy were it not for this option. Definitely wouldn't have been at Penn necessarily and not as happily at Penn, but also who see in all the different ways we're trying to redefine what form scholarship can take a more authentic way for them to embrace a life of the mind that isn't reducible to cliched assumptions about what scholars look like, what theorists look like. And, and I think there's a version of that that for me always reminds me, it's not a trivial thing to say, you know, films and audio recordings, that, that all these other modalities are important because what it does is it signals to people who otherwise wouldn't have found a way into this space that they can be more of themselves, speak with more of their own authentic voices in the academy as opposed to imagining they're disqualified from belonging because those aren't the, the forms, that's not the shape that scholarship takes. And, and, and really the only reason why we have this emphasis on articles and books are really because of conventions of history. We have all this new technology. How hard headed is it? How stubborn is it to not imagine that we can re completely reconceptualize the forms, the style, um, all the different investments we have in knowledge by just taking advantage of things they didn't have in the 1800s, right? If they had it, they would have used it, right? We have it, our job is to use it. And I think when we do that, many more people feel like they might find a space for themselves, for their perspectives, for their questions, and for their own embodied investments in the world at that table. And I think that, and I think that's a real thing. I do, I do like going third, <laughs> thanks, John. But I, I don't mind going earlier. Um, 
I love and agree with everything that's been said. And the only thing I would add is is maybe the most obvious thing that um, that these you know, these other modes beyond text offer a kind of emotional resonance that maybe um, that really good ethnography and really good fiction and you know text can certainly do that. Um, but especially when we're seeing stories that we don't get to see very often, um, I think actually seeing the, the minutia in folks' facial expressions and the interactions and the, um, the you know, all the stuff that is beneath and outside of um, words, um, I think offers a sort of emotional response in a viewer that, um, that is harder to get in, with other modes. Thank you. These are beautiful responses. I'm living for this conversation. Um, I do want to maybe redirect or switch a little bit to get to some of these themes of our festival about health. And to start with, when I'm talking about um, health and the themes of the Minority Health Film Festival, it's not just typically like medicine or um, medical health, but communal health, spiritual health, uh, mental health, emotional health, all of these things, which includes joy and celebration and things uh, like that, uh, kind of under this umbrella. And I'd really like to hear your thoughts or uh, your conversation about the role that storytelling or people's stories plays in this kind of larger idea of health and wellness. Um, and I'm thinking specifically of, like as we've already talked about the trajectory of Sweet Tea, um, Dr. Johnson's work, these oral histories of gathering these stories of black gay men, uh, Southern black gay men and Southern um, black gay women and magnifying them for a larger audience uh, what role, I guess, um, do we see, or do you all see uh, the importance of storytelling in working towards systems of communal health, spiritual health, emotional health? Um, I'll leave it there. <laughs> no, it's, it's a great question. And, I, and I, I've heard enough um, from my colleagues um, at Penn in our medical school and nursing school and dental school around the social determinants of health to recognize you can't have a conversation about health and well-being unless you're putting it into a larger structural um, and social context. And so there's a version of that that also still for me begs the question, who tells the story of what the social is? And are there versions of sociality that are easier to articulate that um, are able to circulate more widely in the larger public sphere? And if so, why? And so I think one of our motivations is saying, you know, the, the stories that Patrick captures in Sweet Tea should be stories that everyone hears, right? It, 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 there's a version of what we always imagine to be the best, the best iteration of storytelling, which is taking the particular, right? Taking specificity and finding the universal within it. And I think there's a version of that you see in the book. It's the aspect of that process that I think as um, a dramaturge, as a stage performer, E. Patrick really captured well and distilled really well. And I think the film does another version of that. Um, whether or not you're black or male or gay or living in the South, you see the human in this film. And there's a version of that, I think, that's also about trying to figure out what does that say for not our physical health, our mental health, and our investment in communal health. If we can at least be willing to recognize that everyone tells us something about ourselves, whether or not we look like they do, whether or not we do the same things and share the same culture and perspective as they do. And there's something in that that I think is really powerful. And I think the film, you know, tries very carefully to, to be an example of just that dynamic by, by using this very specific story. And it's, a, and it's a complicated story, right? So there isn't one black male Southerner story. They're all, we're showing all this variety. And it's, it's the recognition of how diverse we can be while at the same time seeing our common humanity that I think is kind of what can be most powerful about that link between storytelling and the production of forms of health that are inclusive, right? That don't disproportionately allow some people access to what we imagine to be the good life while keeping other people locked out. Nora, did you want to jump in second this time? <laughs> sure, I can. Not to put you on the spot. Um, no, 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 it's fine. I Well, I think in terms of thinking about storytelling and the way that that shows up in this film, um, one of the things that's so powerful for me um, as sort of the, the latest comer to the project of the three of us um, is the way we get to see um, and hear these men's stories like 
you know, 15 years of their lives and the way they're reflecting back. And um, so I'm, I'm thinking specifically of Freddie. Um, he talks about, um, well, the, the original interview with Patrick and the performance um, reflects on some childhood experiences and some traumatic experiences. And, um, and then over the course of the film, he shares details about how therapy helped him. Um, he makes a kind of casual, somewhat casual sounding joke about attempting suicide, but luckily being unsuccessful, um, but really reflecting on the way that seeking out support, um, you know, and, and specifically therapy in his case, um, helped him um, over time and, and that it was a long process. Um, I'm also thinking of Charles, um, who Patrick already mentioned. Um, and for him, I think, I mean, this is certainly the most m powerful moment of the film for me, and I, I think for all three of us, um, when we, we get to see Charles watching his own story um, or, or his own life being told as a story or being sort of um, captured in a, in a narrative form. And um, I think that that's, I think that's really moving for him. I think it's transformative for him. And Patrick can probably speak in more detail about Charles's own development over time. But um, yeah, I, I guess I just, I find the way we get to see these men's stories unfold and hear about various markers along the timeline um, is certainly instructive for thinking about mental health and, and wellness. Um. I'll just only add that I, I think that for a number of these men, um, being able to, well, I'll, before I even say that, being asked to tell their story uh, was a, a kind of um, affirmation that many of them needed um, and to actually be able to tell it and tell the story, um, circling back to what John said uh, earlier, in multiple modes. So through a sort of an oral history setting, but then through film, because what the film does is does a, a kind of dramaturgical uh, work in terms of providing us a context for where these men live, um, eat, work, play, um, does a, a different kind of healing for them. And many of them talk about how important it, it was for them to uh, be in community with each other. Because what you don't know is that uh, through the film process, some of them got to meet each other for the first time. And so that moment in the film where they're breaking bread together is really important. Um, you know, it's, uh, it literally was food for the soul. Uh, and there was, a, there was a moment in which we thought, oh, we're gonna have to cut that scene, but I'm glad that we have just a little bit of it. There's so much that happens uh, at that, uh, dinner party that didn't make the film that is really relevatory um, because one of the things I think that people don't uh, realize is that as we you know uh, reflect on our lives we also continue to discover things about our lives and what this film provided for these men was an opportunity to reflect back, not just on what they said to me in that original interview, but uh, to sort of get to the nitty gritty or some of the more nuanced things that they hadn't really even discovered until they were re-narrating that in the context of the film. And uh, I think that really comes together um, in Charles's story in that moment when I am performing his story for him for the first time. Um, and for me, the beauty of film, because, uh, you know, and, and John and Nora always know I hate film. <laughs> As a performer, the, the you know, I'm, I'm more of a, you know, live person kind of thing, you know, but with film, you have to do it over and over and over again. But that was a moment where it just, every all the parts just happened to align. You know, we didn't know that, uh, we were going to be filming in front of a mirror that had, you know, sort of a triple image of Charles, chastity, Chaz. We didn't know that Charles was going to say, it's just like looking at myself in the mirror. Uh, all, of the, all of that happened in the moment, and we were able to capture that. And it was, 
I think a really moving experience for all of us, uh, you know, the least of which was Charles, but for all of us. So um, in terms of health, um, I think in the storytelling as a mode is a way to affirm people's lives. Uh, and this particular project keeps affirming those lives, you know, because uh, we didn't just sort of shoot the film and then, you know, uh, leave them to the side. They, they've been collaborators uh, as well. They've been partners and uh, uh, have been at film openings, a part of talkbacks. Uh, they promote the film as well. Um, so it continues to do a particular kind of work uh, around um, their own mental health. This is bringing up so many so many directions this conversation can go in. First, I want to say I'm not trying to tell you all how to make your film, but if you wanted to release a bonus feature of that dinner scene, I would love to see it, and I'm sure a lot of our audience would as well. Um, so the audience out there, uh, we're really selling this movie. It's brilliant and beautiful. You should check it out if you haven't already. Um, on that subject, there are kind of two split questions that came up. I'll, I won't ask them both at the same time, um, but. Building off of what you were just saying, uh, E. Patrick, is I'm really interested to hear what the impact of this film has been. What has the reception of this film been so far? Um, not just for the participants, which I think is incredible that it's such a collaborative process. I always think films are stronger and more human and humane when it's a collaborative process across, you know, beyond just the auteur or the director or the visionary. Um, but what has the, the response has been from people that were not participants in this film, seeing these narratives represented? Um, and I'll open that to, to anyone. Nor, if you want to go first this time, you're welcome, but you don't have to. <laughs> so I, uh, <laughs> I feel bad I made that joke, Nor. Um, but so one of, the, one of the downsides, I think, of having a film on the film festival circuit in 2020 is we're not able to take advantage of, of, of speaking to the audiences as much as we would have. So the, the first two um, film festivals that the film got into were, all, were both before the pandemic and it was electric and the responses were great. And, and responses were great in the sense that we were surprised to win awards for the film, which we didn't, didn't necessarily anticipate, um, but we also really appreciated what we heard from the people in the audience. Um, we're in the process now of trying to get all our ducks in a row for a producer's rep to see if we can get a wider distribution for the film. And once we do that, the hope is we'll be able to hear back from more people about how the film moved them. At this point, at least the, the small end numbers we get are very positive. Um, the reviews we've gotten have been fantastic. We just would love to have been able to sit in the theater more. We did it once in Chicago, once in Atlanta, and it was incredible. I mean, it was, it was magical even to be in the audiences um, those first two times. And so we've kind of missed out since then, but we feel like, you know, the film's been getting into great festivals and, and performing really, really well. And, and anecdotally what I've heard, of course, you know, they'll want to be positive to the, to the filmmakers, but, but my sense is people are, are moved by the film and touched by it. And, and that as, as complicated as it is, because I do think it has a kind of deceptively complex narrative architecture. We're trying to do a lot of things in this film. Um, I think it does it in a way that still goes down relatively easy and, and hits the mark with people. And, and hopefully that they won't forget it and they won't forget the men um, who really do a, new, a powerful job at telling their own stories. I feel like that covered it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. It has been, I mean, I'll just say that the being on the virtual film festival circuit, you know, certainly it is disappointing. But um, the you know the the positive side of it is we've gotten to do a lot of these conversations. Um, you know, I, I think it's unlikely even two of us would have been able to attend every film festival you know that we've shown in. So um, the fact that that all three of us have been able to at least um, interact you know with the festivals in this way um, is really exciting. Yeah, I I still get a lot of emails uh, from people who see the film for the first time, and there's a lot of 
uh, excitement about teaching the film. Uh, so um, hopefully we can um, get a distributor and so that um, folks can teach it because there's so much uh, there to to unearth and unpack. And, you know, I've seen this film, you know, I don't know how, how many times, but I still, I'm even now, you know, when I watch it, I still see things that I hadn't noticed before. So um, it, as John said, it's deceptively, uh, there, there's a lot of complicated things in there that seems um, that you wouldn't notice until you see this film for the second and third time. Uh, and I think that was our goal, you know, to not be didactic at all, but have what, you know, I what I think are sort of four through lines to sort of um, weave and, and uh, weave their way through the film uh, in a way that each scene reveals yet another layer. One of the jokes that we kept um, using when we were um, working on the film was that it's very meta, meta, meta. <laughs> and it's true, it's true. And in one of the film festivals that we were in in Utah, uh, the commentator actually got all of that. And we were like, what, you got, you got what we were trying to do? Um, so I, I think that the response has just been fantastic. We won five awards. I think we've uh, gotten into 22 film festivals. Um, so we're doing all right. Patrick, to your point about um, seeing new things, I just want to say when a few minutes ago when you said the scene with Charles um, in the cabaret and the three um, Charles, Chaz, Chaz, I actually, I, even though I, I shot that shot, um, I never thought of it as the as sort of his three identities. But yeah. brilliant interpretation. <laughs> <laughs> hmm. Um. So I wanted to double back a little bit on a previous statement um, that we were kind of getting there uh, in terms of the uh, collaborative process and translating these stories. Um, I'm really interested to hear everyone's thoughts on what you see the, um, the role of the responsibility of the person retelling these stories, um, both in terms of, <laughs> I know I'm opening a deep well here, um, so we can keep it a little brief, but there are multiple layers here because this project has been a book, a performance piece, and now a film, and it coexists as all of these things, but also with collaborative filmmakers, Nora and John coming in and working with E. Patrick's body of work to translate these things. How do you see your responsibility as storytellers telling other people's stories or giving a platform for those stories to be, uh, to be told? That's a good question. Um, I think for better or worse, I probably can only come at it as an ethnographer, right? Who feels like these are um, questions about the philosophy of methodology more generally that isn't even just reducible to film or stage play. And I think, you know, your your number one priority is to make, I, well, I think there are two things for me, as at least as, as an ethnographer, um, I treat as sacrosanct. One, um, is that my job is to make sure I'm doing my best to not just reproduce stereotypes about a community, but to try to figure out how to get a, as much of the nuance, to get as holistic a portrait together as I can um, that doesn't demonize or deify, right? That really says, you know, human beings are in the middle of those extremes, and how do we show all of that detail um, in, a, in a way that really tells us something useful about what we are as a species. But then I think at the same time, part of what I know is really important for me in this process is, you know, that it's always gonna be about humbling myself as a researcher and my audience, right? So no matter how good a job I do as a filmmaker, no matter how detailed I am as an ethnographer, I'm not gonna know everything about the subjects that I'm working on. Um, and my reader will never know. I can write a thousand pages. And so for me, I'm always balancing, trying to give people as, as careful and as detailed a rendition of a world as I can, while also reminding them they're never gonna know it all. It's never gonna be complete knowledge. And so they should, should humble themselves in what they imagine they can take from that material and say about the people in it or the worlds in which they both cohabit. And so for me, that's a, a kind of a really important 
balance to strike, where your job is to really not try to create a positive or negative image, try to be true to what you see. And that takes, honestly, it takes a lot of courage and honesty too. Um, and that's hard to come by often. Um, but if you do it, don't then fall into the trap of almost sort of narratological hubris and thinking that, well, I figured it out, I can move on. Um, because you haven't, right? You have one piece of it, but even that is you know, ephemeral. And, and, and your job is to continue to push yourself, even to disabuse yourself of what you think you've already proven in the last film or the last book. And so for me, that's a kind of ongoing process and my own philosophical approach to doing this kind of humanistic or qualitative social science work. I guess I could add to your two points, your sort of, um, uh, yeah, two points about our responsibility. Um, I think I would add, particularly in film, obviously important in ethnography too, but but especially in film where, we, um, where we're not anonymizing, we can't promise confidentiality or any of the things that we might um, might be able to offer in a traditional text ethnography. Um, I think the comfort of the participants um, for me was was one of sort of my what I felt was one of my paramount responsibilities. Um, so I think of um, of Charles, uh, for whom um, it took us at least a year for him to agree to be part of the film. Um, we took a trip down to Hickory, North Carolina, to to do some shooting and um, thought that we were gonna work with him. And then at the last minute, he decided he wasn't comfortable or he wasn't ready. Um, and I think it was a whole year before we went back and before he agreed. And that has a lot to do with his relationship with Patrick and you know their long-term relationship and then their, their conversations, thinking about what it would mean for him to be on film. Um, and it, I feel really good about that process because now he's so, pleased with the way this has turned out. You may have seen Patrick holding a mug that has Charles's face on it. And I think I think Charles loves that, <laughs> uh, but he's kind of eating up the fact that he's our, our poster child. Um, so that that was an important part of the process. And I think in some ways we could say the same about, about Patrick's own sort of coming into the being a central character in the film, because that took a long time uh, for for us to for sort of John and I to convince him was important, um, and I think that that it had to take a long time, and you know we were able to to go deeper because um, you know because we took that time and and were patient with that process. Yeah, it did take a while for me to come on board, but um, part of it is, and you know sort of. John also knows this as an ethnographer. Um, you know, ethnography has a long uh, sort of history of you know colonialism and um, and you know a long history of people taking advantage of of cultures and taking their stories and and things and um, performance ethnography in particular in performance studies has always been. Uh, about dismantling that kind of project. And um, I never wanted my story or this work to be about me. But what I had to understand is it was always about me. I was always implicated in the work. Um, the way in which that um, was rendered, however, was something that we had to discuss because you know I could have talked about you know self re self reflexivity and and so on and so forth, but that was very different from actually uh, making my story um, central, uh, and I think it is. But one of the things I think that John and um, Nora helped me see, and I and also would say the men themselves, is that it was about our relationships. Um, that was both interesting, but also um, helped me understand the profundity of what I had asked of them. Um, it's one thing to uh, ask someone to share their life, but it's quite another for you <laughs> to ask your own self those questions. And what happened is in the midst of that, um, uh, my the 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 unsettled uh, reckoning 
as it were, between my hometown and myself revealed itself. And that becomes the frame of the story. What does it mean for me to go back to my hometown as an openly Black gay man to a place that celebrated me, but only celebrated part of who I knew I was? And what does it mean for me to sit with the fact that I, and I'm using these words and you know no one else did, that I was sort of a hypocrite in that moment when they're celebrating me that I'm not standing my own truth. So all of that becomes fodder for telling this, you know, this larger narrative about how uh, all of us who are black gay men in the South sort of navigate the contradictions of our lives. And it's it's in the contradictions that's where the meat of the of the film is, I think, because that's the most interesting part. You know, we're we're, we're self-actualized, we're in these uh, wonderful spaces now, but that's all a ruse for some deeper stuff that we need to deal with. Um, and I think the film uh, shows all of that beautifully. Yeah, I would like to add to that. I think um, in an effort to sell the movie to people that haven't yet watched it, is it you, everyone did a really wonderful job or, organically weaving together these different narratives and like the way E. Patrick that you were situated within the film and these subjects and these larger topics, I think is is really amazing. It, it's it's hard to achieve that in a documentary film. So congratulations everyone um, on making this. It's it's really wonderful to to witness. Um, I do want to throw out there as you know we're getting closer to wrapping up. If anyone in the audience has questions, now's the time to submit them. Um, but I also want to say to all the panelists here, I've been driving a lot of this conversation with my questions, and I do want to give a moment. Are there specific things you would like to use this platform to talk about or discuss um, or even ask each other about the film? And it's okay if not. <laughs> I just want to um, do a plug real quick. So, you know, we've talked about the 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 book, the oral history, <clears throat> the stage reading, uh, the the play and the film. So now we have a new iteration. The play script has just been published by Northwestern University Press. Um, and so what's going to be interesting for me now is to see others pick up this play and I'll be watching someone else perform me on the stage. I think that'll be interesting. Maybe that's our next film, John and Nora. <laughs> Even more meta. <laughs> I thought we couldn't be any more meta than we already were, but we can. I do have a, I have a question for Nora. If you, if you were to, um, if you, if you were able to add another hour to this film, <laughs> what would you bring back that we had to scrap? Mm, good question. Well, I, I agree that the dinner party has a lot of meat to it that we weren't able to include. Um, I think we really kind of just use it as a closer and a way to see all the men together rather than actually hear the conversations that happen there. Um, we also shot, um, I wish there was another word besides shot. It's, it's such a violent <laughs> word or has so many violent connotations. But we also filmed... Um, Patrick's 30th high school reunion um, in his, his high school in Hickory. And um, so we filmed him, you know, hanging out, uh, but also we interviewed several of his classmates um, about sort of what they remember about him in high school and, you know, how they feel about his work now. And um, some of those interviews were really interesting. Um, they were, it, it, there were a lot of technical problems with that shoot in terms of sound and the DJ booth being directly next to the interview station. And um, so, and ultimately we didn't, we didn't think it really fit with the story we were telling, but um, that is another kind of extra bonus that we could add. Um, what else? I don't know, John, are there other scenes or? 
I mean, I think you all hit the big one. I'm, I'm, I'm really partial to all the high school reunion stuff. I mean, I think there's a film just in that. <laughs> um, and especially because you all have some footage of you in high school too. So um, I, I, I'm, I'm really interested in how we can use archival footage to tell new stories. And I think, uh, you know, all, all of the archival footage that we unearthed, we use some great stuff. And I'm sure there's more um, that I imagine we could have incorporated too. But um, you'll hit on the, the good ones. You'll hit on the big ones that I keep thinking about when I think about what we left on the cutting room floor. And I guess if we had another hour, maybe more men. Uh, I mean, there, are, there were 65 in your book and 12-ish in the play. Um, so there, I mean, there's tons more stories and, you know, more variation and... I will say honestly that, I mean, I have never brought this up to you all before because uh, I know everyone's so busy, but there, there's a version of, you know, Making Sweet Tea, the series, right? That could chronicle, you know, different men every week, right? Over 10 episodes. Like there's a version of something like that. I think you're right, Nora, would be incredible. Um, and we'd be able to tell so many different versions of these tales. So no, I, so that, I, I would endorse that. Well, I'm really excited at the prospect of more more material and more films and having you all back to discuss them when they're finished. Um, I guess as a way of uh, wrapping up, since we have uh, roughly 10 minutes left, if we need it, um, I would like to know what's next for the film. Um, I think, John, you already mentioned a bit about like trying to get distribution and stuff like that, but um, I would love to hear what is the, um, the remaining journey uh, for Making Sweet Tea, the documentary. So we have a few more festivals, right? You all, we, we, we've been on the festival circuit almost a year. Um, not, not, not quite, right? Or? No, it's a year this yeah. weekend. Really? What was the first festival? Yeah. Was somebody, uh, really? really? Here in Chicago, the Reeling and Festival. And that was September? Yeah. Okay, that for some reason in my head, that was December. Okay, so, so, so I think, you know, now it's kind of, you know, it, it's the final lap. We're doing our waves to the festivals. How, how many more do we have left, did you say? I think we have, well, as of now, we have like five left. Okay, okay. That go into October. Yeah. And, and we have a couple more Q&As, I think, with <laughs> yes. some of those. We have two next, next week. Um, but it really is about trying to get ourselves in order um, so that we can, you know, have the opportunity to position this film so that as many people can see it as, as possible. And so, um, you know, we're in throws right now. I have, I have a form I have to get back to E. Patrick and to Nora and to Steven so they can look at it before um, we send it off to the producer's rep. And, and that really is gonna be for us an important um, turning of the corner. Cause then it, I mean, this, this almost feels like if you think about it as a, almost kind of a sports metaphor, this is like spring training, the film festival circuit, right? But you know, I think we're, we're ready now for the season and to see if we can position the film so it can really, really have an impact and, and create a conversation. I mean, one of the great things about all of this work is, you know, people can use it to talk about important issues. And, and I think this film really is a conversation starter, I think. Yeah, that's a really good point, John. And I can say all of my friends who are academics and teachers are texting me, where can I see this film? How can I use it in my classes? Like, not yet. It's still in the festival circuit. Um, but I'm really happy that there is enthusiasm for using this as a teaching tool. And like you, like we talked about earlier, kind of challenging what we come to understand scholarship to be, because it's such an incredible film and it does such an in incredible job. And it's also a really wonderful window into um, E. Patrick's body of work, um, which I think is great. Uh, we appreciate that, Esther. And can I also just say for any of the folks emailing you or texting you about where they can see the film, they should go to the website because we have the upcoming film festival there. They're all virtual. So um, they can they have maybe four or five more opportunities to see it in the film festival um, format before um, it goes to market, as they said. So so go to Sweet Tea. What, 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 what is it, you all? Is it makingsweettea.com? makingsweettea.com. Yeah, it's even being screened in my hometown uh, of Hickory at the Foot Candle Film Festival uh, that actually starts uh, next Friday. And we'll be doing a Q&A with them. Now, some of the festivals that we're in are geo-protected. So, you know, for instance, the Tampa Bay 
International Gay and Lesbian Film Festival. If you live in Florida, you can see it, but you know, outside of Florida, you can't. And I just want to add for our audience watching today, you can watch it here uh, virtually yeah. in Wisconsin at the Minority Health Film Festival, um, but see it multiple times. Um, I guess this is kind of bringing us to a, a conclusion here. This has been a wonderful conversation. I would like to give each of you an opportunity. Um, what's next for you and how can people support your work, either relating to this film or, or beyond the film? So one thing I would say, I guess, is, you know, I'm hopeful we can, I mean, everyone's so busy and this film took forever because we are so busy. Um, but, I, but I think what's cool about it is like it's steeped for a long time and there's a richness, I think, as a function of it. But I'd love to be able to get the band back together again and maybe do, we can convince uh, E. Patrick to let us do Honey Pot or, or something else coming down the line. But okay. I'm in, I think I'm in already. <laughs> so, so, so that for me is, so I'm done. And E. Patrick's already on the record in a public official way. So <laughs> <laughs> um, I'll just add, cause it, it might be of interest uh, specifically to this audience um, that I've just finished the first of a, a pair of short films, um, short documentaries um, about grief in the aftermath of neighborhood youth gun violence. Um, so this is sort of connected to my own personal research, my dissertation research and a book I'm working on. Um, so we just put out in July a 15 minute documentary that I made in collaboration with a, um, a group of teenagers in Philadelphia. The film's called Our Philadelphia. Um, you can find information at my website, noragross.com. Um, and it explores the the experiences of these black adolescent boys um, dealing with with their grief when they lose friends to gun violence. Um, so that film is out, and then there's a second film about the um, experiences of the of the mothers of gun violence victims and how they how they cope and how they um, make sense of the loss of their sons. And that film will be finished in about a month um, and hopefully out uh, publicly as well. Um, so that that's certainly relevant to thinking about mental health specifically in minority communities. And I, because he's not here, I just want to give a shout out to my husband, Stephen Lewis, who is the editor of Making Sweet Tea, has a new film that's out uh, at the uh, Chicago International Film Festival. He was the editor, uh, the cinematographer, uh, not the editor, the cinematographer for a film called Mama Gloria uh, about a Black trans woman in Chicago uh, who uh, was one of the first sort of open black trans women in Chicago. Um, she's in her 70s and uh, the film is premiering at the Chicago International Film Festival as we speak. So, and will be on PBS in the spring. That is wonderful. I wanna see all of these films that you are talking about. Um, well, I think that brings this really wonderful conversation um, to a conclusion. Uh, thank you, Nora, John, E. Patrick. Really appreciate you being here to discuss the film and your work. And um, it's really a, a true gift to our audience to uh, see this conversation and have access to this truly wonderful film. Um, so everyone in the audience, clap, even if we can't hear it. That's the thing I miss most about being in the theater yeah. is that electric enthusiasm. It really, mm -hmm. it really lights you up. But um, thank you again, everyone, um, for being a part of this panel. Um, I wish you the best of luck in your work. And I hope that this film goes on to be very successful and widely seen because it, it's really wonderful. Um, so to the audience out there in virtual internet land, check out the film Making Sweet Tea as part of the Minority Health Film Festival. Thank you everyone for being here. And with that, I'll say goodbye. Thanks, Thank Ashley. You. Thanks for having us. Thank you for being here. <laughs> Bye. The 2020 Minority Health Film Festival offers a diverse variety of films and events that we just wouldn't be able to offer in the in-person cinema experience. But I think what really makes it unique is the focus not only on public health issues, but the issues that really concern communities of color. If you're looking for a reason to engage or to try it out, this is the perfect time. Just go to mkefilm.org slash mhff 